Oh, yes. Uh, we have covered just a minute. Yeah, we have covered up to um, John chapter 5, verse 9. And now we will resume from John chapter 5, verse 10 onwards. Um, if we could have one person read out verses 10 and 11, please. The Jews therefore said to him, Who is cured? It is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And verse 12. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Okay, we uh we see a uh, very um strange kind of response being made by these Jewish people. Uh, first of all, they see him carrying his, uh, you know, uh, bedding and walking. And uh, according to the rules which had been introduced by the Pharisees, you're not supposed to. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, I was saying that we are now resuming from John chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. OK, so that's basically where we are right now. So here you have um, uh, the Jewish people imposing a law which was not given in the law of Moses. OK, all that Moses said was that uh, the Israelites should observe the Sabbath respectfully and not do work, uh, which basically means, you know, you're not supposed to uh, go to your fields or you know uh, do any kind of uh, um, um, merchandising and earn money and all of that. It Moses never said, you know, don't carry, a, you know, uh, an object which weighs so much. Uh, don't walk, um, you know, uh, one kilometer. He never said any of that. He never tried to restrict their movements uh, as, you know, people doing their normal everyday uh, functions. He never said that. Uh, all that God had told the Israelites was that they must focus on him, not on money making. They must focus on him, not on, on the other responsibilities of life. So he was just uh, saying that the Sabbath is a day when a person would rest from work because God will take care of whatever they need. And they should uh, rest in him, focus on him, refresh themselves, and get ready for another six days of work. That's all that God had asked for. But the Pharisees who came along, they wanted to. Um, had all kinds of uh, clauses and sub clauses and so they came up with rules about exactly how many kilometers you should walk uh, they they came up with rules of uh, uh, if you're carrying an object let us say from one tent to another tent then uh, what should be the weight of that object um, and then um, um, i don't know there's this one commentary which says that uh, they were even told that they should not use the bathroom on on the sabbath I don't know, it just sounds very strange to me. Uh, so it, they came up with a whole bunch of uh, rules on uh, what should be done and what should not be done. They were adding burdens to the people, uh, which God had never wanted added. OK, so they were adding additional unnecessary burdens, which are not required. Um, so uh, over here, uh, this man who was carrying his, you know, his uh, his bed roll, his sleeping mat or whatever, uh, he is not breaking any law of Moses. But these people say it is the Sabbath day, and so it's not lawful for you to carry it. And the man, very in a very simple manner, he replies, "He who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk." Now, what would be the natural response to that? You became well. Why? What was your sickness? What happened? Who's the person who did, who healed you? You know, that would be the basic question which anyone would ask. But then you have the Jews responding in a very different way. They say, who is this man who told you to, to take the bed and walk? You see, look at the way, look at the way, way how their mind is functioning. They are not at all interested that here is a savior who is able to go around saving people. And so they, uh, they're they not excited that uh, to find out who this person is, who can make someone well, who can you know deliver a person from their sickness. They're not interested in those details at all. 
they want to know who is this culprit who has committed this crime of breaking a rule which we introduced who is this culprit so that we can punish him that is their attitude so it shows that they have no concern for the sick they're not happy for this man who has been on a bed for 38 years and now he's walking again they're not happy about that at all they couldn't care less about his welfare they are only interested in their rules, which they have introduced, you know, their uh, little um, bit of power which they have established, and they want to hold on to that. So this is a very wrong attitude. And Jesus, in fact, was always very much against this particular kind of attitude. We don't see that mentioned over here in our book of John in this particular passage. But, you know, when we look at the other Gospels, we are reminded of the occasions where Jesus expresses his anger you know, when they are more interested in their Sabbath rules, rules which they have made up, uh, rather than in the wellness of a person. Um, just to look at one example, because I want to just, you know, uh, uh, highlight one particular phrase. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. If you were to turn in your uh, Bibles to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, over there you have uh, an event being recorded. Uh, regarding a man who had a withered hand and uh, he comes to the synagogue you know to worship god and uh, it, it is the sabbath day and uh, everyone is carefully observing jesus to see whether he will heal the man or not because according to them healing someone and delivering them was also work okay so uh, um, it says in verse 5 so if we could you know have one person read out mark chapter 3 verse 5 and when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to them, Stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. The words used over here, uh, it talks about how he looked at them with anger, and it also says that he was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. Uh, so these were not people who cared about others uh, they did not care for anyone's welfare all that mattered to them was you know uh, retaining their power and influence over people and making them you know do whatever they wanted done so that was their attitude and this attitude always angered god and not just angered him it also pained him it grieved him the word used over there is grieved in um, the greek i think it's the word selepo or something you know where you where you feel pain regarding that so uh here was god who cared about the welfare of people and there you had the jewish leaders who were supposed to be leaders you know shepherds of the people and they had no concern whatsoever for their flock and uh, then we see uh, another interesting contrast over here that would be verse 14. Uh, so if someone could just read out uh, chapter 5, verse 14, please. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, see you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Okay, so uh, Jesus has... Uh, it says here, later Jesus found him at the temple, which means Jesus was looking for him. Jesus was specifically uh, looking for him, and he found him at the temple, and he approaches him, and he speaks to him. So Jesus didn't just simply you know, do an act of healing and walk away from his life, unconcerned about his future, but Jesus cared enough to come you know, after him, pursue him and give him this uh, important piece of advice. Uh, again, we see, you know, Jesus, the physician, Jesus, the doctor. The doctor just doesn't simply, uh, you know, um, you know, prescribe some med medication and then uh, just walk away. If he is a good doctor, he also is very interested in the patient's follow up in the long term. You know, this should not trouble them again. In the long term, what would be best for them? So a true doctor, one who is genuinely concerned, you know, for his patients, he doesn't just simply give do the basic required and walk away. He watches out for the long-term welfare of his people. And so here Jesus comes back to him and says, you know, it's good that now you're back on your feet, but what about your future? What about your eternity? 
and so he says to him stop sinning or something worse may happen to you god uh, you know jesus gives him this word of warning because jesus cares about this man's long term welfare so just in the previous verse you had this bunch of people who were not even happy that the man got healed after 38 years they were not even curious about that uh, complete hardening of the heart on the other hand here you have jesus looking for him you know in all the crowds that he was coming across trying to find out where is this man because he has something important to convey to him and so in verse 14 jesus finds him at the temple and immediately walks up to him and gives him this word of warning so that his future can be safe and secure so we see this contrast between jesus heart and the heart of the jewish leaders and then uh, verse 16 to 17 um if we could have someone read out please i'll read yes 16 17. and 17 okay so they began to persecute jesus because he had done this healing on a sabbath jesus answered them my father is always working and i too must work Yes. This saying is it okay? Yeah, yeah. This yeah. saying 16 and 17. Thank you so much. So okay. so sorry. Yeah, so over here um uh, Jesus says, uh you are saying that I must not work on the sabbath, but my father works on the sabbath. Okay? So um my, because my father is always at work to this very day. i too will continue to work just like he is working uh, so here there's an interesting point being made uh, jesus is saying my father is always at work in 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 indirectly implying even on the sabbath my father is at work so if he is at work working on behalf of people then i too will continue to work on behalf of people um uh, so just one small clarification uh, because um, it says in genesis that uh, uh, god rested from his work on the sabbath so how can jesus be saying that the father is always at work including on the sabbath day uh, so this is just a small technicality nothing uh, you know major uh, because over there in the genesis account when it says that god rested from his work it obviously does not mean that god was so tired after the six days of creation and he needed to take a rest because god does not get tired uh, so over there when it says he rested from his work it means that now he ceased you know from c e a s e d he ceased from his work he he stopped from his work uh, that word is used in that sense because what he had done in the six days was so perfect so complete that nothing more needs to be added there is nothing more to be added because whatever has been done by god he he has created on those six days and he saw that it was good and it's perfect and it's complete and there's nothing more to be done and so he rests he ceases he stops from his work okay so in that sense and so he says to the israelites because of what i have done the completion with which i have given you this planet and all that there is in this planet one day you know don't think about your work on that one day just rest in me trust me and know that i can take care of you i who created in 6 days and finished everything that needed to be done for the human race i can take care of you so you don't need to slog on the seventh day and you know go about running to your fields and running to the market uh, to get your financial transactions done no on that one day remember who your actual provider is the who the actual creator is who has given you all of this and just rest in him that day focus on him rebuild your faith so that they know the next day onwards you can again face the challenges of life so in that sense they were supposed to celebrate the rest it was supposed to be a rest of trusting him it was supposed to be a rest of uh, just believing in him and enjoying him so uh, on the sabbath obviously god would have constantly been continuing to look look down upon the israelites who are down below on the earth and he would have continued looking after their welfare so jesus uh, so god never uh, rest, uh, rested from work in the sense he never stopped watching out for them on sabbath day 
So even on Sabbath day, they were protected. On Sabbath day, they were continued to be provided for. They continued to be taken care of. Uh, and so Jesus says, the father who has always been working on behalf of his people, um, he is my example. And so in the same way that he has been working, I too will continue working even on the Sabbath. Uh, we have an Old Testament scripture, uh, Psalm 121, verses 3 to 4, where it talks about God who never sleeps or slumbers, is always watching over his people. So God does not rest. He does not sleep. He continues to watch over his people even on the Sabbath. Um, so uh, we will now come into John chapter 5, 19 onwards, where it's where we have more uh, doctrine you know, being mentioned. Um, so we could maybe begin by reading out verses 19 and 20, please. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than this, that you be marvel. Now in these two verses, uh, we, we see how Jesus talks about how he has chosen to place himself under the Father. Okay, so uh, he says, I don't do anything on my own. I only do whatever I see the Father doing. Uh, so uh, he places himself under the will of the Father. But at the same time, we see that this is not some kind of, you know, uh, boss and, um, you know, uh, inferior, you know, that it's not that kind of a relationship. Rather, it says in verse 20, the father loves the son and shows him all he does. So it's a relationship of love that is there between the father and the son. It's not that of a boss and an inferior. OK, and uh, then in verses 21 to 23, he talks about the other aspect of who he is. Uh, if we could have someone read out 21, 22, 23. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son, that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So uh, he talked about how he has chosen to place himself under the father's will. And so he never does anything just like that on his own. He does only what is in line with what the father wants. but. Also, at the same time, he is in every way equal with the father because in the same way the uh, father you know, raises the dead and gives them life, the son also has the capacity to do, do the very same thing. So they both are equal. And even though they are equal, the son chooses to place himself under the father's will. And uh, so over here, um, Jesus says, uh, therefore, because of this, you must honor me. You know, um, and if you are not honoring me, then it would mean that you are not honoring the one who sent me. Um, and also, there's another point that Jesus makes. Um, yeah, if we can look at verses 24 to 27, if if we could have one person read out, please. Most actually, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most actually, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those here will live. Okay. Um, so here um, we, we see very clearly that Jesus is not saying that I am the Father. He says that he is the son of God. Okay, so um, later on, like I said, false doctrines started to come into the church. And uh, there were people who were saying that both the father and son are, are just one single person. And um, um, in the ancient times, this was a cult which was known as Sebelianism. And uh, today you have um, uh, 
people who kind of still believe this this kind sort of doctrine and they are supposed to be the oneness pentecostals uh, who believe that the father and the son are just one single entity uh, but that is not what we see over here here jesus very clearly says uh, that the father and the son of god are two separate you know uh, people um, because he says in verse 26 as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son also to have life in himself so both of them are not um, persons or entities to whom someone gave life they always had life they always were uh, so no one had to give them life and bring them into existence they always had life in themselves already so they are two separate uh, you know persons uh, in in that sense so um, again uh, there are uh, you know uh, there were there was this ancient cult called arianism and uh, those people said that the, the father is god but jesus is not fully god he's just partially god because uh, the father made him okay so in that sense and uh, even you know today in our modern day we have people who follow those kinds of doctrines one of them being the jehovah witnesses who believe that it's only uh, jehovah yahweh who is god and that jesus is not fully god um, so uh, these things are actually uh, put to rest through this particular passage because in this passage jesus talks about how he has chosen to place himself under the father even though in power he is equal with the father and he goes on to say in the same way the father always had life in himself the son also has always had life in himself and he has the authority to judge because he is the son of man who is talked about in uh, Daniel chapter 7. So one day he is the one who will be judging and so they better submit to his word and they better you know, accept him because he is the one who is going to be judging them. Uh, so these are all points which are brought out in this particular passage. Uh, and then we, if we can move on to 28, 29 and 30, if we could have one person read out these three verses, please. Don't be so surprised. Um, indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. Should I continue? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, sorry. I, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I can carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Yes. Um, so over here, Jesus says, um, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, uh, but him who sent me. Now, um, um, under the Jewish culture, if any person is, you know, uh, coming there as a messenger of his master and he uh, very correctly and in a very you know with with integrity delivers all of that all of the message which the master wanted conveyed and in no way is he trying to serve his own interests and is being truthful towards his master such a agent you know who is conveying the message of his master would be considered most reliable and he would be regarded as a person with full authority they would accept the authority of the agent in speaking to them uh, because why he is completely fulfilling whatever the master wanted him to convey uh, so they would uh, regard his words as having full authority now in the same way jesus is saying you see i am a, i'm a person who never said anything on my own i never uh, preached doctrines which were my own i always have only spoken through the father so he says because i have been a faithful person in conveying what the father wants conveyed therefore he says um uh, you know i have never tried to please myself i have always tried to please him therefore he says you know uh, you must accept what i am uh, saying to you, uh, the people should be willing to accept the authority of Jesus in speaking these things, and they must be willing to place their faith in these things. And this is one um, small you know, 
point mentioned over here it talks about how um, um, a time will come uh, when uh, jesus will you know will call out and when he calls out people will come out from their graves and it says those who have done what is good will rise up to live you know they would have eternal life so they would live in the presence of god uh, but those who have done uh, what is evil they will rise up to be condemned and um, uh, so you know we we are aware right when we all uh, rise up we would rise up in our resurrected bodies and uh, the interesting point made over here and in fact even in revelation we see the same thing um, there are people who are resurrected uh, to enter into eternal life and there are people who are resurrected to be thrown into the lake of fire so you know for you to suffer you would need a physical body to experience the suffering and so it's really very sad that there are people who will be resurrected not to enjoy the uh, the the you know the wonders that god has in awaiting but rather they would rise up in a resurrected body to be condemned to be punished to suffer pain uh, uh, to be separated from god forever so it is such a terrible terrible thing because a resurrected body is something wonderful i mean uh, a, a human who died a physical death and uh, no longer you know inhabits the body and the body disintegrates or maybe is burnt or whatever and uh, that is now being re resurrected once again uh, every single particle of that body comes back together and it's given a new um, form so that it's no longer like a human body but it's rather a resurrected body and to have a body like that and learn that because of the choices you made in rejecting jesus now or what are you rising up with for you're only rising up with this resurrected body for punishment it's such an amazing terrible terrible tragedy so it should make us want to share the word of god you know the gospel with people because it is so sad they are going to be resurrected one day just like us but they will be resurrected for uh, punishment they will be resurrected for a life of hopelessness there is just no hope left because they have been separated from god and uh, that should create in us a burden uh, to really share the gospel with everyone so that they can be resurrected with hope to look look forward to something exciting and enjoyable rather than just be condemned you know forever and ever away from the presence of god um moving on from there uh, verses 31 and 32 yeah if we can just have verses 31 and 32 please if i bear witness of myself my witness is not true there is another who bears witness of me and i know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true yeah um i mean uh, based on the old testament based on passages like deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 15 it was generally considered that if you if someone wishes to say something and they wish to prove that it is true uh, they should there should be at least two or three other witnesses who can establish that what this person is saying is the truth and uh, so here jesus uses uses that particular tradition and he says i can come up with three witnesses uh, you know to confirm that what i am saying uh, is true and uh, the three witnesses that he uses are, are uh, john the baptist and then uh, he talks about the works which he is doing so his works the the, the very miraculous uh, works which he is doing they also testify to who he is and the third uh, testimony he says comes from the father himself so these are the three testimony uh, witnesses that jesus uses to confirm that he is um, you know divine and that he is equal with the father so uh, we we know i mean what john the baptist uh, was preaching about jesus he was pointing everyone towards jesus and saying that he is the messiah follow him and coming to the works of jesus they too were testifying that this person is not ordinary he is doing things that only the father can do only the, the things which only god can do so these things should have proved to them uh, that jesus is indeed uh, the son of god like he was claiming to be but 
they did not uh, choose this testimony they did not accept this testimony why it's because they had hoped that the messiah would perform certain particular kind of works these were a hardened people who didn't care about the welfare of the people they were not really concerned with the people were getting healed and delivered and their lives were giving you know they were being given a second chance to start life all over again these things were not of interest to them they were hoping for a messiah who will come and do political works who will you know um, uh, destroy the romans and reestablish the kingdom of israel that was the kind of works that they were looking for and so when jesus came and began to do all these wonderful things of deliverance and compassion they couldn't care less they rejected this testimony even though this was such a powerful testimony so it is the common people in fact who were willing to accept uh, what jesus was saying the leaders on the other hand they had been hoping that their power would rise to a whole new level once you know the kingdom of israel is re established so they were very very disappointed they had been hoping for greater power but that was now denied to them on the other hand what were they seeing they were seeing that the flock which which had been placed under them you know because they are leaders and they have a uh, a flock of israelites under their care they were seeing that someone has come and he is now helping the flock delivering the flock healing the flock and that's never what they wanted they wanted to be able to rule over the flock suppress it burden it and you know maintain a firm hand over it so this was definitely not what they wanted so in chapters 4 and 5 the message comes across so clearly um you know jesus his heart and the jewish leaders and their heart there's a clear contrast between these uh, two categories of people in in these two chapters um all right we will um maybe look at verses 39 to 44 uh and yeah we can in fact you know gain one or two learnings from this uh, which would be good and useful for us uh oh yeah before that uh, we talked about the testimony of the of uh, of Jesus works the third testimony he gives is that of his father and uh, this probably is a reference to you know the baptism of jesus where an audible voice comes out from heaven and uh, says that this is indeed my son so uh, and uh, now i don't know whether everyone standing over there could clearly hear that voice or not uh, so uh, but john the baptist explains to him uh, explains to them very clearly what the voice said he says that the voice clearly told that this is my son so um, they have received the testimony of the father as well okay so these are the three testimonies that jesus gives to uh, back up his claim that he is the divine son of god so now we come into uh, verses 39 to 44 uh, which just sounds like a lot of heavy words but there is uh, there are you know truths that we can learn even from this so if one of us could just read out 39 to 44 please You search the scriptures for them. You think you had eternal life, and these are they what which said testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Uh, verse forty four. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor honor that comes from the only God? All right. So um, Jesus comes in a very uh, simple and humble manner, not what they had hoped for. Uh, they wanted a conqueror. Uh, they wanted a, a, a political force, you know, who could represent them. but jesus comes in uh, comes in a very uh, humble way in the sense he keeps pointing all the glory towards the father he says what the father wants that i am doing i can do nothing by myself except for the for the you know the father enables me to do so he is um, humbling himself in his human capacity and because he presents himself in that manner uh, the people are not very happy with him um 
because uh, Jesus is constantly pointing to the Father and uh, they are um, not very interested in the Father first of all and that is why Jesus points out that truth to them very clearly. He says, um, verse 42, he says, I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Um, you see, when we when we started off the book of John and we looked at those uh, first disciples, they were so excited. They were so happy because uh, they had been waiting longingly for uh, this Messiah that God would send. And uh, so uh, they had a passion for the things of God. They were excited about the things of God. But here, when Jesus is talking to these Jewish leaders and he's pointing out to them, uh, you know, the truth about himself, they are not interested because he's pointing them towards God. And uh, for them, over the centuries, God has just become something that must be followed as a ritual. He is no longer someone who excites them. And that is why Jesus says in uh, verses 43 and 44, a very valid point. He says, I have come in my father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Um, they had this um, desire for big personalities. You know, people who will stand there in the front and claim that they are somebody very knowledgeable and uh, very powerful and influential, and they would talk uh, in a very impressive manner, and uh, everyone would be impressed by such people. Jesus, on the other hand, was doing the exact opposite. He, instead of you know, um, instead of puffing himself up and making himself appear big, he was humbling himself. Uh, you know, staying in the background, not getting into confrontations at this moment. You know, in, in the early days when he was avoiding a direct confrontation with the Pharisees, all of this. So they, he did not look very impressive to them. Uh, why? Because these are people who accept glory from one another. For them, in the eyes of the world, they need to be something big. In the eyes of the world, they should be considered somebody influential. And Jesus was uh, very plainly says in verse 41, I do not accept glory from human beings in the sense I don't need uh, you know, uh, the appreciation of people to establish who I am. Whether people appreciate me or not, I am God. So uh, you know, he, he says, I don't need human uh, beings' um, you know, compliments uh, to place me where I am. I already am uh, where I am. So uh, these people, on the other hand, were more impressed by big personalities, by you know, tall words, rather than by someone who is coming in a very humble way and uh, sharing with them uh, the kingdom of God and talking to them, pointing them towards the Father. That they were not impressed with. That is not something that they wanted. And um, so they say that some of the scholars, they say that this phrase over here in verse 43, if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. They say that maybe Jesus was indirectly even referring to the Antichrist who would come in the end times. And the Antichrist would come in his own name. He's not trying to say that I am the Messiah because you know we have many, many false messiahs right now. People who are claiming that I am the promised Messiah. But this man, Antichrist, when he comes, he doesn't pretend to be the Messiah being sent, uh, you know, being talked about in the Old Testament. He would clearly establish himself as someone who is um, an alternative. He would offer himself as a better alternative uh, to the Messiah. And uh, so um, maybe Jesus is over here uh, actually referring to the Antichrist when he says, if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. And uh, that would is something that uh, would happen in the end times if Jesus is referring to that particular thing. Um, all right. We are kind of coming into the last uh, portion um, of John chapter 5. Uh, let's look at verses 45, 46, 47. If we, if we could have one person read out, please. Yes, it is. It's in it isn't I who accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you 
Yes, Moses in whom you put your hopes. If you really believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe in how you will you believe what I say? Yes. Uh, so it's um, Moses specifically talks about Jesus in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where he says that uh, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me uh, from your midst and uh, him you shall hear. Okay, so uh, um, very specifically over there, uh, Moses is talking about the Messiah who will come in the future. And then in the other prophetic books, of course, there are many references to the uh, Messiah. Now, um, common people, ordinary people who are not necessarily scholars or religious leaders, they were able to understand what Moses had said, and they were able to link this to Jesus, you know, the prophecy which was given by Moses. They were able to connect it to Jesus, but it looks like as if his learned leaders refused to make the connection. Because in, uh, first, uh, in, the, in the very first chapter of John, where we, uh, you know, we saw Philip uh, talking to Nathaniel, uh, if we were to just go back, you know, in our Bibles right now to John chapter one, verse forty-five, over there, Philip is talking to Nathaniel, and this is what he says: He says, "We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote." So, Philip is someone who has studied the law of Moses, which is the first five books, and he has also studied what the prophets have said and he is able to make the link very clearly and he is able to say see this is the one that Moses was talking about this is the one that the prophets were talking about and here you have very learned Jewish people you know the Pharisees and the scholars who seem to know everything and they are unable to make the connection between the prophecies given and so Jesus says ordinary people are beginning to understand what Moses talked about, and they are reaching out to me and submitting themselves to me. You, on the other hand, who, are cons who consider yourselves authorities in the law of Moses, who know your first five books by heart, you are refusing to accept me. And so he says, I don't even have to accuse you before the Father. Moses himself will accuse you because you have considered yourselves, uh, you know, um, complete authorities in everything that he has said and you seem to uh, say that you know all and you have known and understood all that what Moses said but here you are refusing to believe what Moses wrote about me and so he says that Moses himself will condemn them for their disbelief in what he has taught and um, um, I think it is in Luke yeah, Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, where it talks about the, you know, the incident at uh, on, the, on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus um, explains from the scriptures uh, how all of those scriptures were talking about him. Uh, it says over there in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27, um, how slow to believe all that okay, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then it says in verse 27, beginning with Moses. So what does it mean over there, beginning with Moses? Moses is just the title which is being used for the first five books of the law. So the, the law of Moses. So beginning with the first five books and then all the prophetic books, Jesus explains to them how those particular scriptures are talking about him. Okay, so that's what is mentioned over here. Um, yes, I think that covers most of the important things. Anything else that came to your mind? Any questions that you have or anything that you would just like to, you know, uh, share your thoughts on chapter four and chapter five? If not, you know, we can just close with a word of prayer. So anyone wants to say something or ask something? No? Okay. Then um, maybe we can close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, today's class. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the things that we could learn from chapters 4 and 5. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, unlike the Jewish leaders, we would have a heart for the people, not a heart for power and position, 
but a heart for the people. I pray that we would uh, you know, imitate Jesus Christ uh, in the way we approach people rather than imitate those leaders, O oh Lord, who are not interested in people at all. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us compassionate hearts uh, that would also pe pe treat people with respect and dignity in the same way you treated, treated that Samaritan woman with dignity. Also, O oh Lord, we pray that uh, uh, you would cause us uh, to submit to you fully in the same way that you always chose to submit to the Father. You being completely equal, O oh Lord, uh, with the Father, you chose to submit yourself to him. And so how much more is it important that we should be willing to submit to you? Give us hearts, O oh Lord, uh, that will uh, have that kind of a surrendered attitude. Thank you, O oh Lord, and we pray that all these learnings which we have learned at the right time, when we need these things, uh, I pray that you would bring this, these things back to our mind, that you would remind us so that, Lord, we can walk in these truths which we are learning. Thank you so much, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for you know paying attention and uh, you know for your, for some of your questions and your thoughts. And we'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor.